Okay, good afternoon, good morning. Um, welcome to the first uh, session of the fall 2016 uh, Sonokesis Digital Classics module, which is titled uh, Digital History and Archaeology, and uh, will be served basically as the general introduction to this, um, this semester, which will be a very short semester, it'll be a lot shorter than the last summer semester, which was 23 weeks, this will only be 11 weeks, um, uh, which is basically the length of um, the length of my semester here in London, but um, but I know it overlaps as well with a lot of other people's semesters. So uh, hopefully it will be useful to the to the um, classes of other people as well. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the program as a whole, um, and then we're going to have a little bit of discussion of um, what Synochesis um, is, what they've got background to Synochesis Digital Classics and Synochesis um, more largely is. And then we'll very quickly go down through the program of this of this semester. And some of the presenters from later this term um, are here and will um, we'll present their uh, a brief preview of what they're going to talk about. Um, and then I will give a very short presentation um, about issues around text and objects and uh, artifacts. And we um, will that will hopefully kick off a discussion of the theme of this of this semester. So um, unlike many of the digital classics um, modules that have been taught either through Synochesis here or elsewhere, this semester is um, focusing on specifically those parts of the digital classics syllabus which are not text focused. Um, so normally we found that if we, if we didn't think about it too much, teaching a module on digital classics, it was in almost entirely text. When we really made made some effort and thought about it to make it more diverse, um, it was maybe about 25% um, geography and imaging and data structure, and the rest was still text. We talked about grammar, we talked about tree banking, we talked about text markup, we talked about text annotation, translation alignment, and various other um, topics. So um, for this semester, we're going to try as an experiment to talk about all those things other than text, um, which um, which obviously are not unrelated to people who study text and people who study history and even people who study literature, but are a different kind of content. So that's um, that's sort of the background of, of why the module has the title that it does. Um, the next semester, the spring summer semester um, in 2017, will be um, probably back to usual programming, um, slightly more text focused, although not 100% text focused, I suspect, but that. Um, that semester um, syllabus will be set um, in December and then will be advertised very shortly after. So uh, just a quick um, introduction to how this um, this semester will work. The, there will be, for anyone studying this um, this course um, as part of um, as part of their uh, their uh, master program or at any other level, um, there will be two elements to the course. There will be the common sessions, which are these sessions that take place here through Google Hangouts, or you may be watching them on YouTube, which are, they will be slightly more interactive, but they more or less fill the role of a lecture in a traditional um, course. And then there will be um, some other sessions that take place at your home institution that are run by, um, by your tutor or by you, if you're one of the tutors, um, that are um, and those will, those will involve most of the discussion, most of the practical work, most of the uh, assessment um, will be organized um, at a local level. Some people will, of course, be following this only through the common sessions and not through a local course, and we hope that'll still be useful to all of them. And um, some people will have uh, a more or less formal connection to these common sessions in their actual taught course. My students, for example, will, in addition to this one hour um, common session every week, they will have a two hour session which combines seminar and tutorial where they will discuss some of the bibliography that has been recommended and where they will have an opportunity to try with um, someone on hand to help some of the software or um, other uh, technical um, methods that have been that have been discussed. Um, but those, those will all be offline, as it were. 
So that's basically how, how this session works. And the, the reason that we're doing this um, this way um, is very much linked up to the way um, Synochesis Digital Classics and indeed Synochesis before it has always um, worked on the raison d'etre of that program, which is that um, probably um, most of us would like to teach um, Digital Classics in one way or another, but most of us um, either don't have enough faculty to teach it at our own institution with as fully rounded a course as we like um, or would not or maybe even are alone at our institution and wouldn't be able to do so um, and or um, may not have uh, enough students to um, justify a module of this kind taught um, entirely at our own institution so by combining um, efforts with a dozen other people and several dozen other students from around the world we can both share out the load, we can distribute the expertise, and we can make it worthwhile because there's not only two students being taught this semester, there are probably dozens of students who are following this, um, either full credit or not, over the course of the semester. So that's broadly how, how we hope this will work. Um, we, I've, I've sort of briefly talked about the raison d'etre of synochesis, but um, the Synochesis Digital Classics program has been run by Monica Berti for the last couple of years, run out of Leipzig. Um, and maybe, Monica, you'd like to talk for a few minutes about um, the more, a little bit more about the depth and about, about the background of Synochesis and, and Synochesis Digital Classics. Okay, thank you, Gabby. Hello, everybody. So, Synochesis Digital Classics, yes, is, a, is an international consortium of digital classics uh, programs developed by the University of Leipzig, the Alexander von Humboldt Chair of Digital Humanities at the University of Leipzig, and the Harvard Center for Hellenic Studies. Why this name Synochesis? Because the original program was developed at the Center for Hellenic Studies in the United States, and this program uh, has uh, each fall semester two courses for Greek and Latin. The idea was to extend Synochesis um, to a global audience, I can say, so outside the United States, and to contribute to Synochesis with uh, digital technologies, given that now we have them applied to um, the study of uh, Greek and Latin. And so this is why two years ago we started Synochesis Digital uh, Classics. Now we have a big community, and now I'm very happy to see that this fall semester, for the first time, we have a new track in London, thanks to, to Gabby at the Institute of Classical Studies. And so the idea is to build an international community of faculty members, students, and people interested in learning uh, what we can do with digital technologies and in uh, producing data. So that's why we have, uh, well, we have a website at the University of Leipzig, but we have a GitHub repo with information about our program and data we produce during uh, the course. And every year we have a planning seminar in Leipzig in uh, December for uh, planning the new academic year. Now, well, we started before with this full semester, we will have uh, our planning seminar in December, but the idea is to gather people to discuss uh, the syllabus for our semesters, the program, and how to involve uh, people. So, <laughs> I don't know if I have, so if you want uh, to get information about Synoikesis, we have uh, um, the GitHub uh, uh, repo where you have links uh, to planning seminars with live broadcasts. Uh, we have class outlines for every semester, including uh, this uh, semester. We have slides and we have data produced during our courses. If you have questions, uh, I'm here. <laughs> Anyone else have any other questions about, about Synochesis? My, my favorite slide that um, you normally show when you do this is your slide showing just how global Synochesis is. So maybe we, we, could, we could remind ourselves that Synochesis um, has been contributed to, is contributed to, and has students in Germany, Italy, France, the UK, Croatia, Bulgaria, Georgia, the US, Brazil, what have I missed? Finland? Uh, yes, we have many Norway. countries. 
Yes, yes, Norway and uh, Egypt, uh, of course. Egypt, of course yeah, yes, yeah. And, and we have people today in our hangout from Brazil and from Egypt, and we have two strong communities in Brazil. Definitely, we started our first session in Brazil, and then also in Egypt, I have to say, in Georgia. So, yeah. And then from the next semester, we will have also Iran. We have people yes. there working with Persian on translation alignment. So, yeah, mm -hmm. of course, the technology helps us. So we, we can, the only thing is that for Hangout, we can host only 10 people, mm -hmm. but uh, on YouTube, everyone can follow our um, classes and uh, we are available uh, through emails and other tools so for uh, discussing with people and helping students yeah yeah you know this is this is really great um so uh i'm very excited to be stealing your idea and uh and uh and doing this one um cool so um let me see if how do i Switch back to me presenting. Right, let me see if I can screen share the program. I think this is the program. Okay, am I, is that, am I showing the program? Yes, everyone's muted, but I... It's I still see. black, the screen is still uh -huh. black, but... Okay, I can see the program. Yeah, uh, this, okay, now we can see it. Okay, okay, great. Um, so yes, and is it is it is it large enough? It may not be very clear on a on a small YouTube window. I might make it just a little bit bigger. Um, but um, no, it, so is, it is it is perfect. Also on YouTube. Great. Okay. Thank you. So um, yeah, so uh, I, I just want to very quickly run down the um, the, the program for this uh, this semester. As you can see, the the dates on here of the common sessions um, for for my students, the the important dates are the uh, the seminars and tutorials, which will take place five days later than each of these dates on Tuesday mornings, but for the, for the rest of the world, the common sessions are what um, you need to know about. Um, and of course, the common sessions don't have to be watched live. They're, mo they're most fun if they're live and if you can participate and ask questions, but, um, but you can watch them on YouTube at any point in the future from, um, from now onwards. Um, we've even activated um, the YouTube technology DVR for this, so you can um, you can rewind and, and watch watch again the bits while while we're on um, apparently, um, which sounds reasonable. Um, so um, so yes, as you can see, there's there's eleven weeks um, total on this. There's twelve weeks total on this um, on this program. I guess I guess yes, eleven not counting this week because our, our term hasn't technically started. So I, I think of this as not not being a week, um, and also this is more introductory rather than um, than important content. Um, so um, this week, I've, I've already talked about the, the um, content. Um, next week on uh, October the 6th, um, Sebastian Heath from New York University is going to talk to us about 3D, um, 3D imaging in, um, in various forms. And Sebastian might actually um, unmute in a moment and tell us um, a little bit more about, about that class. Uh, yes. Um very happy to be joining uh, the community. It'll be my first time. Um, and yeah, we're gonna. I'm gonna give a introduction both to making 3D models and and what that means and the sort of files that are produced by that. But also make sure we spend some time, or that I spend some time, talking about why one might want to do this. Um, what is the balance of potential and actuality? How does 3D overlap with issues of uh, open data? And where are we in a sort of um, trend towards institutions making more and more data available is 3d is 3d data coming under the same sort of trajectory of eventually everything will all be open um, and what does it mean for 3d to be useful and how one might want to use it making models and why to make models will be the general themes that i hope to um uh hope to cover and then uh, put people in position locally 
to go forth and try things, but whether, whether it's downloading and interacting with existing models um, or actually making them yourselves, um, hopefully enabling people in the, in the, out, in the wider community to uh, go forth and actually do stuff. So that's, uh, that's on the agenda for next week, and I'm looking forward to it. Great. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, let me get the screen back up. Um, yes, so that's um, that's next week. That's week two. The um, the third week. Um, well, actually, maybe I'll do that in this in a slightly different order um, because we have we have two streams. We have the imaging and the three D stream, and we have the geography stream, and they're overlapping with each other slightly. So um, the uh, the second of the three D um, uh, classes will be on will be week four on October the twentieth, um, which will be about three D modeling. Um, in, in the sense of computer aided design, in the sense of creating models from scratch, rather than in the sense of scanning and imaging um, existing objects and creating models from those. Um, and this this will be a class then um, showing uh, some of the uh, context of 3D modeling and what its applications are in classics and Asian history and archaeology, and um, discussing some of the tools that are available, and then giving a quick demo of um, one of these tools, SketchUp Make, um, and um, setting an exercise on modeling um, a fairly well documented um, building from Pompeii in SketchUp Make with a view to um, primarily relearning really the, um, the skills um, and all the, some of the very many, many features that SketchUp Make offers for 3D modelers. Um, and this, this will lead to um, possible further um, uh, uh, exercises afterwards for students who want to do this. Um, in more in more detail for um, for, for credit. Um, so then, skipping back to the week before, to the first of the three geography sessions, um, which will be on gazetteers. Um, in this session, we'll we'll um, talk about the Pleiades gazetteer. We'll talk about the Plagios project, and in particular, the Recogito annotation tool. And the exercise we will set will be related to a project that uh, Valeria, who's presenting that session, um, is uh, in charge of, which is a project called CALCS, uh, Cross-Cultural Afterlives of Classical Sites. Um, and we'll talk about annotating um, Arabic and Ottoman names on medieval maps. Um, and we'll show how that, how that is done in Recogito. And Osama Gad will help us with that for the, um, for the Arabic parts. Um, anyone who wants to take part in that who doesn't read Arabic, um, there are plenty of maps written in Latin script which can be, um, can be annotated in that way as well. Um, so that's the, the general outline of that. The second of the geographic projects would be then week five, um, October 27th, where Tom Elliott, who I believe has just joined us, will be um, talking about the tool called Carto, previously known as CartoDB. Um, and uh, Tom, do you, want, do you want to spend 30 seconds giving us a quick preview of that? Class. Sure. I'm, I'm sorry I tuned in late. I couldn't find the link to the Hangout. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to doing a talk that, that kind of falls between uh, the initial talk on geography and the one coming up on GIS. Uh, basically, I've taken as my mission the fact that everybody uh, feels like at some point they want to make a map and uh, as historians and philologists and others, we appreciate some of the values of maps, but we've never been formally trained to do them. Um, I, of course, we can't give people a uh, complete course on cart you know, digital cartography and that sort of thing in, in a single session, but uh, between the readings and uh, discussion and demo during the session, I hope we'll at least set some of the uh, basic expectations and make people feel like they're enabled to get started uh, playing around with some of the kinds of tools that are available for making maps. Um, in particular, we'll try to build on data that people in the course have already assembled from prior um, uh, exercises uh, in Cardo so that they uh, can have the satisfaction of the data they collected actually being visualized in a map. So that's, uh, that's that session in a nutshell. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, cool. And then the session after that will be then on uh, geographic information systems or science. Well, how do you, what, what does what does GIS extract to in your in your worldview, Leaf? Um, so Leaf, Leaf, would you like to talk about that briefly? 
I think you will need to unmute first. Still can't hear you, Liv. skip over this and come back if you can if you get your uh, well let's see if you get your if you get your connection back in the next few minutes I'll um, we'll, we'll come back to you um, but um, yes if not Leaf's, Leaf's presentation will have to be a, a surprise um, so then the uh, back to the program the um, the week after that we have three or four sessions on um, structured data um, related um, uh, topics of which um, the first will be on data modeling and ontologies which uh, Ariana Chula and Charlotte Tupman will be running and um, I think Ariana is with us. Ariana would you like to 30 seconds introduce that yes. um, session? I hope you can all hear me. Hello? Yep. Sorry for the messy toys behind me. I'm working from home today. Um, so I'm also very excited to join Sino Ekizis for the first time. I will be teaching um, this class together with Charlotte Topman. Um, we will try to introduce briefly what the ontology is, and in particular, a specific type of data model. And we will do this mainly by using the CDOC uh, CRM conceptual reference model, which is used in the cultural heritage sector to document um, uh, basically information about uh, records held, for instance, in libraries, archives, and museums of historical relevance. Um, we will do this both at the abstract level, so introducing the concepts, the components of how you do an ontological analysis, how you create a data model, but also with some examples of specific formalism that are used to express ontology, as well as looking at specific applications of ontologies in digital classics and digital history more in general. Both Charlotte and I worked on a specific project where some of these ontologies are to be built from scratch. We hope to bring that experience uh, to the fore, and hopefully with the exercises and some, um, some of the examples that we bring uh, to, to the class, um, students will be able to, to engage with this at a more concrete level than just reading uh, the, the readings that we have in the list. Great, thank you. Um, so then the session after that will be um, a data structuring more generally, including data querying. Um, and I think Tom is probably um, in charge of the, uh, the program for that at the moment. Is that right? Uh, yeah, Sebastian and I are kind of iterating on exactly what we want to do in that session, um, but we do have some readings of general outline in place. I think, uh, in general, the idea is to survey um, kind of uh, the most common uh, data formats and how to deal with them if you if you encounter them, um, specifically the data formats that we see for uh, sharing around data in ancient studies uh, today. And we'll do that in the context of a bit of discussion of standard querying tools like regular expressions and like SQL, uh, and also of uh, the definition of some of those formats. Great, thanks. Um, the session after that then will be on data visualization. Um, and this will be run by three of my colleagues in the Institute of Historical Research, who are the next door neighbors of the Institute of Classical Studies. And that will be basically taking that once uh, just forward um, a step and um, talking about how if you um, if you have a data set, um, you can visualize that in certain ways, both to learn more information about it and to communicate um, some of the information about that. Um, so they'll they'll talk in general terms about what is data visualization. They'll talk about some classic visualizations. They'll talk about how visualization can be misleading, um, just as any other form of communication can. 
um, and how um, give some examples and set some exercises um, on exactly um, how we can make data visualization academically rigorous in various ways. Um, so that's um, that's that session. Um, and then uh, it'll be followed by another session, which will also include elements of visualization, the session on network analysis on December the 1st, which will be co-run by Silke van Besselaar and uh, my colleague Greg Wolf. Um, I think Silke um, is here and might tell us very briefly about that session. Um, yes. Um, uh, we will be giving a general introduction, first of all, um, of social network analysis, and then we'll quickly move on, I hope. Um, to show some historical case studies and so showing how ancient historians uh, are now using network analysis, network visualizations um, and we'll finish that off by um, letting the students do an exercise and giving an introduction to uh, the software that I'm mostly using, um, Gephi. So it would be good if students could uh, already have downloaded that. Um, yeah, that's about it. Great, thank you. Um, then, where are we? Uh, then on December the 8th, there will be um, a session by uh, my colleague John Pierce from King's College London. Um, we'll be talking about crowdsourcing heritage and conservation. Um, and he'll be using the case study of the Portable Antiquities Scheme at the British, well, which is, which is um, hosted at the British Museum, um, but is a national scheme. And he'll talk about some of the background and some of the controversies around that scheme, um, which is based on a, um, a rather unusual element of, of UK law, which is the Treasure Act, which says that unlike most other countries in the world, certainly unlike most other countries in Europe, um, if you find um, an antiquity somewhere, either on common land or on your own land, and it isn't of a, of a, um, a particular subclass of antiquity, which is very, very rare or very valuable, then you can keep it, you can do what you like with it. So if you find a Roman coin made out of base metal somewhere, um, that's yours. If you find a bit of pottery somewhere, that's yours. You can do what you like with it. You can sell it on the antiquities market. You can you can put it on your um, mantelpiece at home, or you can destroy it. There's no there's no law saying that the state owns um, something that you find. Um, and the portable antiquity scheme is a way of um, of trying to engage people who have found antiquities and and um, that are not necessarily uh, uh, given to museums, um, such that they can at least be recorded. Um, in various ways, and that um, that that is both um, I think quite quite valuable in its own right, and also leads to a fairly large data set of small portable antiquities. And so John will talk about some of the um, the features around that. And obviously, it's, it's controversial because some people feel it legitimizes um, heritage theft, um, as they would see it. Um, so that that's um, that will be discussed in that session, and then the final session of this semester, um, we'll sort of come full circle and talk a little bit more about textual sources a little bit um, and uh, this will be uh, Monica Berti will talk to us about historical sources and um, you might tell us a little bit more uh, about that session. Yes, so I so in this session I will uh, talk about uh, specifically about historical sources that are uh, historical textual sources that are lost in the original form but still extant as quotations and text for use. So what we usually call fragmentary literature and I will present a project that I am developing in Leipzig for working with uh, the fragments of the Greek historians. And well, in the class outline you can see, so you can access the project and then the students will be, the students will be able to, uh, to, to use the tools I have to access the collection, select the collection and uh, uh, try to work with this uh, data. Uh, I would like to add one thing about the program. So we have 12 weeks, uh, which is perfect in the sense that this is, uh, well, this corresponds to a semester and this is the usual model for snow exists. 12 weeks or sometimes 15 weeks, for example, in Leipzig we have 15 weeks. In the spring semester we have this uh, long uh, a course of 23 weeks, uh, as Gabby mentioned at the beginning, because we try to combine different academic calendars, uh, especially in the spring, summer semester, not only, well, in Europe, we have many different academic calendars, but not only in Europe. So that's why we decided to have this long semester starting. We usually start at the end of January and we end in July. So this is the reason. But for now, in the fall, 
we have a normal <laughs> semester. So that's why we have 12 weeks, which is the, uh, the model for Sunoikis. It's also in the United States. Uh, Sunoikis is at the Center for Many Studies, uh, has uh, 12 weeks. So <laughs> just a note about the program. Yes, absolutely. If you, um, if you run a, a 12 week, if you run a 23 week semester, that's basically half a year. Um, so you're effectively running Sunoikis throughout, throughout, you know, you're being there one, one afternoon a week for an entire year, um, where everyone else is just dipping in and out. Right? Because I'm just there for the first 10 weeks, because that's my semester. And then I, you know, the last 13 weeks, I'm not there. Some people don't turn up until week 15. Um, yeah, well, but that's the model. That's why we, yeah, we're, yeah. yeah, we're building a special, I have to say, syllable sure. so that can people yeah. can join at the beginning and then leave the program and other people can join later. So that's the difference yeah. between the two semesters. Yeah. 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 So just to show the flexibility of Sunoikis is Digital Classics. We can have yes. courses corresponding to specific semesters and calendars or bigger courses, bigger semesters. Yes, yes. No, absolutely. I, I was just thinking it would be nice if eventually we have enough enough of these things running um, uh, consecutively that um, we don't uh, we don't have to have one person who commits to be available at the same time every Wednesday afternoon for eight months. Because yeah. um, um, I saw the look of relief on your face at the end of week twenty three. You know. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm always very very happy to host these hangouts, but yes, of course, yes. <laughs> yes. it's tiring. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, so, yeah, the only other thing I would um, I would um, finish by saying about this program is that um, the I think everybody knows where to find the program here on GitHub. Um, it's github.com slash uh, I will make sure the link is always in the YouTube video um, as well for anybody who um, who hasn't um, who, who you know who comes in yes. on this? Oh, so, sorry, yeah. sorry, Gabby, yeah. for interrupting. Yeah. But now in the chat, I see that in the YouTube chat, I can't post links. I don't know why. You can try, but there is a chat, and now there is a new chat, right. and it tells me no. Remove any web addresses and try again. So <laughs> last year we could uh, uh, put links uh, in the chat, but apparently mm -hmm. now is not possible. Anyway, I'm I'm trying just to see. But we have the slides. Oh, so exactly. in the slides. Exactly. So in the slides, you can you can, you have the link. Yeah, we can put them in slides, and also on YouTube itself in the in, yeah. the in the section below the below the video. So there isn't one for this week, but I'll make sure there is for future weeks. So for, for yeah. people who come in that way, um, but so for people who do have the um, the the program on um, on GitHub, um, we will ask the um, the presenters before their session to um, add a link to their slides, any slides they're going to use. Um, so that people can um, use them. And I will also, um, just before the session goes live, I will add the YouTube link in there so people can, um, can find everything they need through, um, through the, the course pages. Uh, and as you can see, there's a link there to my, um, to my slides, which I'm about to put up for this, um, for this session. Um, so um, I think that's about all I wanted to say about the program as a whole. The, um, uh, it's, Pretty much gone to to time um, so far. Um, we'll see how um, how well that lasts once I start speaking to slides. Um, that's a very unpredictable um, activity. Um, I guess I have to stop screen sharing first and then move to the slides. Um, but um, yes, anyone who's seen me um, speaking at workshops and lecturing before has um, will have experienced me saying. So I'll just spend three minutes on this, and twenty five minutes later. Um, uh, actually started speaking about what I said I was going to do, but um, okay. Can you see my slides now? Yep. Okay. There's um, and there's also a link to um, to this slideshow on um, on the front of the slides here as well, um, which I think should be should work because the slides have been made public to about, to everyone. Um, some of you may have seen these slides before. These slides I've used many times before. I just want to make some very general points about the interaction between text and the objects that texts um, sit on. So um, yeah, this doesn't look good anymore, does it? Um, this is Chrome. Um, I'm assuming you can't see this very well now. Anyone? It's yeah, small. it's letterboxed into a very yeah. tall um, yeah, profile. That was, that was not 
um, we're now seeing we're now seeing um, the, the whole the whole um, Google slides view yeah um, this is this is intensely irritating in Firefox this works perfectly but because I'm using Chrome right now because um, this isn't my usual account um, it's coming out but you can see the slide reasonably okay anyway I think that's good enough for what I'm um, for what I'm going to do here I'm not not going to show it lots and lots of text um, so the, the point I wanted to um, to make was simply um, to uh, to look at a few texts um, since um, this is this is key to what to what we look at often as classicists and to say a few um, um, a few general things about what we're talking about. So this this is a text, right? If I were to if I if, if we were in a classroom and I'd, I'd I'd show each one up and I'd ask you to shout out what what is this, and you'd say this is a papyrus, right? It's, it's that that's what kind of text this is. Um, and then for this next one, if I say what's this, you'd say this is an ostracon. Um, we look at the next one. This is an inscription on marble. Um, it's either slightly yellowish marble, or that may just be the light under which the photograph was taken. Um, and through this, this is and this is also an inscription. This is um, this is a, an Egyptian wall relief of some kind. Um, this is a physical book. This is a printed book. Um, you may or may not be able to see on the slide that it's it's, a, it's an early copy of uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, this is some text from an ebook. Um, this is a webcomic. This was never printed. Um, and this is a tweet. These are all texts, right? We've, we're, we're all we're all um, happy with that. The um, the the one thing that we have in common, and this this might I mean, I've cheated slightly because I was the one replying to my own questions. But the one thing that our um, our answers had in common with all this is that we're not describing the content of the text. We're not describing the type of text. We're describing the object on which the text is written. Right. So whatever kind of text this is, um, you know, we said this was papyrus. That's the object, not the text. So texts and their objects are inextricably linked. We can't we can't separate out the two um, and uh, pretend that we're talking about texts in complete isolation. Even the ebook um, that we had here, the fact that it's an ebook, um, probably in um, an EPUB format um, of uh, a novel, um, was um, is was the first thing we wanted to say about that text when we said, what, what, what kind of a text is this? Um, so when we, when we focus entirely on text, as if texts were not part of objects, we, we're missing a huge amount. Um, when we make additions of texts, we again, um, we have to remember that texts and their objects are uh, very in intimately related. Um, if we look at, is another example of an inscription. Um, again, well, you can't tell by looking at this what sort of inscription that is, um, although you can tell what the object it, it is on, and that might give you some clue as to what sort of inscription it is, but this is a statue base. Um, and what, um, what we're looking at now, um, uh, if I was feeling particularly philosophical on a, on a day, I would ask students what this is a picture, what this is, and they might say that's an inscription, and then we'd have an argument about is it an inscription or is it a picture of an inscription, is it a photograph of an inscription, is it a digital scan of a photograph of an inscription, which has then been turned into a, um, a digital photograph, which is now projected onto the screen, and how many steps removed from the from the actual inscription is it? But let's 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 just assume this is a photograph of the inscription. It's one step removed from the inscription because it's a photograph, not the object itself. Um, this um, next image is one step further removed. Uh, it's a drawing. It shows us things that the photograph cannot show us. Um, for example, it shows us the text slightly more clearly. It shows us the text and the, the object, the base, and the statue, both of which are extant, it shows us them together and what the relationship between them was in a way that we can't, um, we can't see with the object itself because the base is in situ on the site of Aphrodisius and the statue is in the museum um, because statues are objects of art and bases are not. So that's, that's, it's both lost a lot that the photograph had and it's added a lot that the photograph did. The next level of possible um, edition we might have of this is a diplomatic edition. This tells us slightly more than the drawing does because it, um, it expresses the text 
in slightly normalized form and in Unicode characters, so it's searchable, it's readable, it's copy and pasteable, um, but it also loses some things that the drawing has, right? And then the conventional edition, the edition we'd expect to see if this were published, would be the, the fully editorial edition with the Leiden conventions in it and the abbreviations expanded, words separated by spaces, diacritics added, um, so it's readable as Greek. That again loses some of the information of the diplomatic transcription, actually not very much because um, you always know that when something is in parentheses it wasn't there on the original stone, but it, it, it loses some of the, um, it, it's, it's taken further away from the stone itself than the diplomatic transcription was. So we have these four levels um, of different kinds of edition. If we, if we accept that a photograph is an edition because it has had um, scholarly intervention between it um, between the object and its delivery to, to the audience, even if that is just in terms of light settings, choice of film stock, choice of camera, um, etc. Um, to the slightly more um, intervened with drawing, to the diplomatic transcription, to the editorial transcription. Now we can get closer to the object than the photograph does. We could create a 3D scan, um, as we'll see next week, which gives us um, a lot more information about the object than the single photograph does, but it still isn't the object. I think it's, it's still clear that it's still an interpretation, even if it's an interpretation that we have very little control over in that it's, um, it's, it's algorithms that have done that interpreting, that's still interpretation and intervention between the object, um, the physical object and the digital object. At the other extreme, we can also see things which go further from the stone. We can see a normalized and corrected transcription, which is again, slightly further from the original text, the original stone, than the editorial transcription, and we could go further than that, we could have a translation into a modern language, etc. And I'm sure people will come up with examples, um, whether in epigraphy or in other fields, um, that, that, that are elsewhere in that spectrum from being very close to the object to having more intervention, more scholarly and editorial intervention from, um, from the object. And we, um, we need to bear in mind that we both never forget that this text is from an object and that whatever, um, whatever view of the text we're seeing is a, it's an interpretive view, it's an intervention um, in one way or another. And the last point I want to make is, um, is a point about the, um, the place of the text. If we go back to our, um, our inscription on the statue base, which is um, in fact, is inscriptions of Aphrodisius 8.412, and that's the URL for it. If you wanted to uh, to go and look at the entire edition for that and learn more about that um, that object and text, um, this is the photograph that I chose to show you. This is a quite good photograph that shows the object in fairly good context. Um, a photograph that you'd more likely see in a um, in a scholarly edition. Of, of this text, um, if again we're talking about it as a text rather than as an object, would be a photograph like this, which um, which shows us the text more clearly. Um, you can read some text on this one, which you can't really do on the one before, um, but it also it shows us the object less clearly because um, it's the text that's important for, for it's the text that you want to illustrate in, in the context of, a, of an edition of this. Um, notice also that this um, inscription, which was taken, I think, in this photograph was taken in 1980. The, um, the previous one was taken in 1976. The base, um, the, the, the pedestal beneath the base, um, which was um, there in 1976, is not there anymore in 1980. The statue base has been moved, um, so we've lost some of its archaeological context um, already, which this photograph has lost for us. Um, in fact, it's kind of the other way around. The, um, the base, which it was shown on in 1976, is not the base of that, but not the pedestal of that statue base. It's, it's a pedestal from a set of statue bases which are all more or less identical. So it's illustrative, it shows pretty well what this would have looked like, but it's not the actual base of this, the actual pedestal of this statue base. Most people probably wouldn't be able to tell that just by looking at the photograph. That's just an aside. Um, so this is a photograph we tend to see in the edition. The other photographs, including the base, misleading as it might be, um, other photographs, including this photograph taken from above, showing the top of the base, showing the, um, the mechanism by which, or showing some evidence for the mechanism by which the statue was attached to the base, um, is um, one that's not normally shown. This is one that would be very interesting to the archeologists. 
And this obviously this photograph was taken by an archaeologist, not by an epigraphist. Um, another photograph that um, might not appear in a conventional edition would be this photograph of the back of the base, which shows this, this is not conventional decoration on a statue base. This is decoration from an altar. Um, this, this piece of stone was uh, originally an altar, which was later reused as a statue base. That tells us something about the object's archaeological history. Um, and another photograph that you'll almost never see in an epigraphic edition is this photograph of our object. This is, um, this is showing us the context where in the tetrastoa on this object appears um, and how it relates to the other objects nearby and so forth. This is showing it in situ. Um, this is of absolutely no use whatsoever in reading the text on that inscription, but it, it is of, of a whole lot of use for um, locating the inscription and putting it in some sort of context and showing what this inscription might have looked like um, in, um, in its originally designed context. Obviously, we still don't see the statue on top of it because all those were taken away to the museum, as I say. Um, and the final um, image that you might um, uh, be shown is this is um, the, the geographical or the top top topographical um, context of the inscription. And the, the, this little number 62 down here is our inscription here in the middle of the Tetrastoa. Um, and that's, uh, that's the um, that's the last piece of context, if you were. This is, again, um, getting us further away from the text on the stone, um, but giving us in, invaluable um, place information about the artifact. Um, and I wanted to end with just a few words about, about open standards, um, just because these are um, really important for recording all of the kinds of information that I've talked about in this brief um, presentation. So um, if you are uh, an epigrapher of the kind who's only interested in that photograph of the, of the uh, text, um, the standard for digitally recording a lot of this information um, might well be Epidoc, which is a form of TIXML. Um, Epidoc is very, very well suited for recording the text on the object, but also the object's history and some information about the object description and location. Um, if you wanted to put that location itself um, more to the forefront of your um, uh, description, um, then the Pleiades Gazetteer would be um, the source of the identifier and the Pelagios project might give you the context for, um, uh, for, for how to record the relationship between the, the object and its location um, or various different locations that are related to that object. Um, there are standards like the CIDOC uh, uh, CRM, which um, was mentioned briefly a few minutes ago, um, which um, talks a lot about the, the heritage metadata the, um, uh, in, in, in an events-based um, model for, for where the object is now and what, um, how it got there and, and um, what its curational history is. Um, there are other types of object metadata which the European Digital Library um, has developed and which will give us um, better uh, uh, description for. And if we've created a 3D model of this object, um, either a 3D scan or a 3D visualization of the object, um, then the London Charter will tell us um, a lot of the sort of um, metadata that we need to attach to a model of that kind. And um, the, uh, the Scotch ontology is one way to record that information in, um, in RDF, in, in linked open data. So, um, so we're actually, we're fairly well served by uh, standards and vocabularies for describing the kinds of things we might want to say about an object. Um, and it's, it's this sort of picture, this sort of um, linking together an object's uh, text, an object's historical context, an object's archaeological context, its appearance and its description and its materiality and its location, geographical um, and archaeological, that, um, that I hope this module will give uh, an overview of how to, um, of how to address uh, those, sorts of, um, those sorts of issues. Um, so yes, that's about all I had to say there. Um, are there any further comments, questions, discussion before we go forward? Is anyone keeping an eye on YouTube? I don't know if there's been any left anyone's Anyone's actually watching or has left any comments there? No comments on there as far as I can see.
Anybody have any final words to add then? If anyone is speaking, you're muted. Uh, Gabby. Yes. Um, so here, let me turn my video camera on and see. Uh, yeah, no, thank you for the, the, the mention of 3D models. Um, we'll make, a, make an excellent segue um, into next week's topic in terms of um, a, a, any one representation of an object is not complete, especially when one starts thinking about the context, just to have information about the object of itself is not enough. So I think it's an excellent introduction to some of the very, the wider things we'll be talking about next week. Um, I'll take this opportunity to say that um, I'd be grateful if people could um, make an account on sketchfab.com and those links are, are in the syllabus and I'll, I'll make them explicit. And there's also um, an opportunity to download the software photo scan from Agisoft. Again, I'll make sure that link is up there. Um, as I indicated in my introduction, um, I hope that everybody's able to interact with 3D models and that will be via Sketchfab, which is a cloud-based tool. And many of you, uh, I will encourage everyone to, to dive in and think about actually making 3D models with photographs um, we'll look at that next week, but installing photos, uh, Agisoft PhotoScan will um, get you uh, well along the way. Though again, there's sort of a graduated technical hurdles. Everybody should be able to use um, sketchfab.com. Um, I really, um, I hope everybody's able to dive into, into PhotoScan. And so that's the sort of technical side of my talk. But again, we'll, we'll look to go from, <clears throat> You know, this, this, I think this course is going to, you know, part of it's going to be about bits and, and, and clicking on things, and all of those will always implicate the larger issues that have been addressed so far. So I look, for making that, look forward to making that bridge uh, next week. Great. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, yes, Agisoft PhotoScan is, is not free software, right? But you can get a 30-day trial license from them, um, as I understand it, which, um, which is fine for, for this exercise. Um, we might need to think about some other approach if someone wanted to do um, an assessed project involving um, photogrammetry because they, they would need something which worked beyond beyond those 30 days. But that's that's something we can discuss um, maybe next week or we can discuss in um, in the local in the local classes as that becomes um, relevant. I, I, I recommend um, the use of the, the remake um, software for people with Windows because there's a free academic license for that, which is not time um, constrained, but um, obviously, if you don't have a Windows machine, that doesn't um, that doesn't work for you. So there may be other um, other options to discuss um, for that in the future. The following week, all exercises will be done online using Recogito, so there's no software to install for that. So that's um, that's fine. Okay, great. If no one else has anything to add, then I'll say thank you all very much uh, and see you next week, I hope. Cheers, bye. Thank you, bye, bye, Gabby, thank you. Cheers. Bye, bye, bye. bye.